Welcome to this quantum conversation. I am so pleased to introduce you to David Hoffmeister, who is a beautiful teacher on awakening and the power of surrender, surrender to the higher self, surrender to the Holy Spirit. David is a perfect example of the constant peace and joy and presence that comes when we do this surrender of the ego. David, thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for inviting me. It's great to be on this. I like the name, the Quantum Conversations. That really grabbed my attention right away when you first emailed me. <laughs> Well, we'll talk about quantum because we really are in that quantum world and it does interface with consciousness and it happens in this now moment, in this presence. So we'll share a little bit on what it means to really live quantum. For now though, I'd like to ask you about your own personal story. You have been a teacher in A Course in Miracles for decades and you started about 30 years ago in your own path and yet you actually surrendered to Jesus and began to share the messages that came through you from Jesus. Can you share what led you to the Course in Miracles? Yes, well I actually was out in California in uh, 1986 for a humanistic psychology conference and um, it was Carl Rogers last uh, uh, conference with uh, humanistic psychology before he passed away and they had, uh, amazing speakers Virginia Satir, Francis Vaughn uh, who has passed away now as well but amazing teachers and I was there and I was just feeling this expansion huge expansion and I felt like in my heart uh, like something big was about to happen and then as I went down to the where the the psychologists and the transpersonal psychologists and humanistic psychologists shared their books and CDs and tapes and so forth I was drawn toward the end of the uh, the room and there was two students of a Course in Miracles teacher named Tara Singh and they had his video playing there as well as a lot of books, his book that was out, Nothing Real Can Be Threatened, and Ken Wapnick's uh, book, Forgiveness in Jesus, was there. So I bought both of those and the course, and I had this feeling as I was watching the screen and hearing Tara Singh speak, like I knew these ideas, like they were ancient ideas, and it was a strong feeling of recognition. So that's when the Course came into my life, when it first came into my hands, there was a huge feeling of recognition like, oh my gosh, this is somehow my life's path, even though I didn't fully know what that even meant. And I felt like a tsunami of love like wash over me. Uh, and I thought, okay, this is big, whatever this is, I don't know, it feels like my life will never be the same. So that's, that's how it happened, right there at that moment. A tsunami of love. That is the, the guidance, right? That's the pathway home. And I love that it was a recognition because that's the best uh, example that we could use. It's, it's a recognition. It's this feeling and it's not in the mind. Okay, so then you began your journey and you uh, studied A Course in Miracles and you went along your way and then you started meeting with other A Course in Miracles people and groups and meetings and that unfolded in its way. Share what happened then. Yeah, it started off with uh, starting to attend a, a Course in Miracles group and then two, three, four, five a week around the Cincinnati area where I had been living most of my life and then um, around 1990, I started getting this strong call to just uh, go up to uh, the foundation for A Course in Miracles up uh, on Lake Tanana with uh, Ken and Gloria Wapnick. And so I started going up there and then um, was guided to uh, actually go meet Tara Singh 
up in Monroe, Michigan. And so there was a phase that was very mystical. I, I was meeting people left and right. I was meeting uh, translators of the course. So I was meeting people from all over the world, pretty much up in Roscoe, New York, where Ken was working with the translators. And uh, having a lot of mystical experiences would people would uh, just come up to me and say, I have to talk to you, I have to take you out to dinner. Uh, sometimes it was about their, an issue in their own life, and sometimes it was from a, a loved one who had passed on, uh, and they were having all kinds of questions about that. But uh, it seemed like there was all these very orchestrated holy encounters where I was used in a very full way, and to let the presence of love come through, and also to let Jesus start uh, speaking through me. At first, more one-on-one -on -one and uh, small groups, and then uh, at course groups, and then eventually I was guided to start traveling, and it started to come out in bookstores and backyards and barbecues and uh, everywhere I went. It just kind of opened up. And I love that story because it is a true walk of faith, and it was a surrender of the ego. Uh, there was a movie in the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment where you shared this journey of your own where you went out and just started to travel um, with no money, no path, but this inner knowing, which was, in your interpretation, the voice of Jesus speaking through you and, and guiding you. So isn't that wonderful that you were taken care of. What does that say about this whole process that we're going through? That's a great metaphor. Yeah, it certainly, it helps bring an example of the, the very first characteristic of a teacher of God in the Manual for Teachers, which is trust. Because for me, it was, there was a moment uh, at the beginning when I was going to course groups where I felt like it was like a turning over experience, like, okay, you got me, uh, I'll give over my future goals, ambitions, I give it all. I give you my body, my, my skills, my abilities, anything that I have, my resources. It was like a, a surrender of, say, use them all for the glory of, of God or for the glory of the good of everyone. It's basically what the prayer was. And then after that, it's like, wow, things took off in a real fast way. And, and I think it, it really built my trust because uh, when the travels came, I wasn't particularly inclined, David wasn't inclined to travel, uh, and I was quite shy most of my life, so this was kind of like uh, going out on a, almost like that uh, movie Aladdin, you know, I felt like I was, I was going out on a, on a, a whole new world, a, a new fantastic point of view, as the song says, and that was the feeling. So it was very much of an adventure where things were being provided for me, but not in the ways that I had grown up with, in the Protestant work ethic. You know, I had uh, very structured ways in which I should receive support. And then Jesus was saying, oh, I will take care of you in ways that you can't even imagine, but you just have to allow yourself to be used uh, in a greater plan. So what did you do to really call forward um, this, this surrender of yourself and you allowed to be part of that greater plan? Was it prayer? Any guidance there for those so many who wish to do this fully? I know trust is a key factor, but what did you do to really anchor that in and go for it? Well, I think it was a combination of, um, initially it was when I received the course, I used it more like an oracle instead of trying to read the book in a chronological way or even do the lessons as they're presented. It was, it was more like I had a, a modern day oracle where I would pray and formulate questions in my mind and then I would just reach down and open the book and, and the answers would be given to me every single time. Uh, and then Jesus would say, the Course is not even special with this. He would take me to a library and he'd say, go down that aisle and pick out that book. Stop, pick out that book, ask a question and open that book up. And, and I'd be like, okay. And it, it was like everywhere. And then it started to be 
songs on the radio. He'd say, ask a question and then just turn on the radio <laughs> and you'll get your answer there. Okay, billboards, oh my gosh, bumper stickers, oh my gosh, it's everywhere. He was saying, yeah, that's how it works. You pray and I'll give you the symbols. So at the beginning it was an immersion though. I, I think um, after I would pop the book open and get my answer, I was so curious and I was, I was so full of inspiration and like a sponge wanting to soak it all up that I would read on until my eyes would get heavy and then he w Jesus would just say, okay, rest and relax, have a snack or take an, a walk or have a nap and then I'd come back and do the oracle thing again. So after a while it began to, I would notice around eight hours a day I was uh, reading the Course, uh, first as an oracle and then reading on. So that was like an immersion and I think that really cleared my channel, you know, opened me up to uh, hear Jesus in a very conversational way where I could see He was speaking to me all the time and He was like a, a little bird on my shoulder just chirping away, giving commentary on things. Uh, I would even watch other teachers and he would give commentary on their teaching like, oh, pay attention, this is an important point and he was using it for discernment. Uh, so that I feel like was a huge speed up to, to be able to, to really listen and follow later on on the road when I was facing all kinds of uh, decisions, decision points, uh, that's how it started. So beautiful. Thank you for that. And so um, it's that, was it the still small voice inside? And did you find that that voice was always speaking to you in hindsight of your entire life? But it was just this point where you began to recognize, oh, that's Jesus. Yeah, I think, I think earlier, I mean, I would have called it my intuition, little nudges that we all have, those little hunches that we have, those, those feelings that come in in a strong way. Uh, it wasn't quite like a, a cohesive stream, uh, like almost like a, like a ticker tape going on where, where they're actually, I think once I was, the channel was cleared out, then it would come as a stream of thoughts that was very soft, very gentle, could be quite firm at times, uh, uh, and certainly sometimes the ego reacted to it, uh, because it would be qu quite firm. Uh, but it was also very helpful, always very helpful and always very positive and very, very nurturing. It was never commanding me to do anything. It never demanded me to do anything. It was like offering instructions, offering suggestions, uh, saying you would be good to listen to this and then it would share something, but it, was, it wasn't like a, a dictator in any way. It was uh, very, very friendly. That's so beautiful. And so, again, we can't reiterate enough the clear channel that you had to become. You had to clear yourself out. And so, even then, where you were able to hear those messages, you still had a reaction of the ego. <laughs> so, I mean, how was that for you? What was that like? Um, your ego would maybe get offended by some of this or uh, share an example of how you dealt with that, how you recognized it was your ego and how you dealt with it. Well, certainly uh, when it was the ego reacting, it, there was fear involved. Um, Maybe it was fear of the future, like where is this all heading? Uh, where is this taking me? Am I going to be like a, a bag lady or a homeless man uh, just wandering the streets? You know, it would kind of project out a, a fearful future. Uh, at other times, it would be a hesitation uh, or there would be like a surprise, like really? Or are you kidding me? Or, you know, it would be like a reaction and then yet the guidance was very very strong but very persistent, uh, very much like it was with Helen Schuckman, very persistent, like here's, here's what, you know, I'm asking you. And um, I felt like 
there was also, it was very gentle with me. So when I had periods of resistance, uh, mostly for me, it would take the form of fatigue. Like uh, my eye, eyelids would get very heavy. They would feel like lead weights. Like uh, the resistance was no more. Like I've gone as far as I can go here. And then it would be a gentle, like take a nap or go have a snack or take a walk, do something refreshing, go for a swim, uh, something. And then I'd come back all wide-eyed and open and curious and ready for more adventure. Uh, and I think that that attitude was, was the spirit in me uh, working with my mind saying, you know, we respect exactly where you're at. Uh, you will not be forced into anything. You will not be coerced. Uh, this is all going to, to come at your beckoning. And, and when you're ready, uh, we will go forward. So I really liked that quality. That, that was, it kept me very engaged, you know, and, and that's why I think it could go very fast. Okay, beautiful. So the Course in Miracles, A Course in Miracles, that is so well known around the world. And there's many listening and watching this program who are familiar with it. But those who are new to this, new to awakening, they may not be familiar with it. And the information is quite special. I'm getting goosebumps just uh, feeling into it and talking into it. Can you recap how it was delivered. It was delivered to Helen, right? And there were others yes. that you mentioned who carried this work forward. But that is a very, I mean, it is a required course. So let's um, have you recap how it came into being. Yeah, it, it came into being where there were two professors at uh, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City uh, one, Bill Thetford, uh, who was the head of the department, and then uh, one of the uh, research psychologists was, was Helen Shuckman. Uh, and they were both uh, working together on a lot of projects, and, uh, and uh, basically Bill was going on one day basically saying, oh, it's so frustrating, our professional lives, and we have you know, conflicts in the department and interpersonal conflicts, and he just basically said there has to be a better way of living. And he thought she would kind of, his uh, friend Helen would just poke fun at him for making his little speech. Uh, but instead she said, you're right, Bill, and I'll help you find it. So there was a joining, just like you and I joining here on, on this uh, beautiful dialogue. There was, a, there was a joining and then uh, they, Helen started to receive some psychic kind of dreams, dreaming in color and messages coming through and, and Bill was more the calmer, reassuring her, just, just let's just see where this is going. And then uh, she started to take down an inner dictation of, of thoughts that said, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. This was in 1965 and they were in the middle of their professional lives as very eminent research psychologists. So uh, she was quite shocked with this stream of thoughts uh, because as we know, psychologists and psychiatrists tend to lock people up uh, who have an inner voice coming or they diagnose it and use drugs. <laughs> but um, he basically was holding her hand, holding her arm and saying, just take it down and let it say what it's going to say, and if it's just gibberish, uh, we'll throw it away. We'll throw it in the wastebasket tomorrow. But when they read it, you know, this is a course in miracles, it is a required course, and that beautiful introduction came, uh, they both agreed, uh, wow, this seems really profound, almost like an answer to our prayer. And so they let it continue for seven years. And that's about how long it took to complete the dictation uh, for all the notes and then there was of course editing and things that came afterwards but that's that's how it came 
so beautiful that it really was a channeled piece and it came 2000 years after Jesus. And so I just love that story. Thanks so much for sharing it in 1965. So beautiful. All right. Well, it is a required course. And in my own experience, in my own life, I ran into it. Well, I didn't run into it, but it was introduced to me 25 years ago. And that was a, a level of a, an awakening for me too. And so it really is a required course. So when we look at our planet and we see the outside world, I know some feel heavy in the heart and they would love to step up and um, wake up and assist the planet in waking up. So it really is a required course, this notion of waking up, waking up to this greater presence of who we are. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think uh, even before Helen started to receive uh, the dictation, there were certain kind of messages that were coming through right at the beginning. And um, one of the messages was that the world is worsening uh, to an alarming extent, and people are being called from all over to help in the greater plan of awakening. And even though that was back in 1965, here we are in 2019, and it seems like those, uh, those words are pretty applicable right now, uh, all these years later. And it's a matter of the Course is really saving time. So when we look at the perceptual world, it, it is a world of distortions. It is, uh, it's an outward picture of an inward condition. So it's really the, the world events, the human condition is a reflection of a, of a mind that is split. Uh, it's a split consciousness that, that has the voice for love in it, that small still voice, and it also has the voice of, of the ego, death, destruction, fear, guilt, uh, shame, you know, th there's a mix in there. And so we are really looking through a darkened glass, like it says in Corinthians in the Bible, we're not really seeing clearly, we, we don't have spiritual vision and we have to do the inner work to clear consciousness, to clear away the mirror of our mind in order to see the world differently. And that's really what the, the mind training practice is of A Course in Miracles. Beautiful. And one of the things that you do to bring the teachings forward and to apply the teachings is that you look at movies. And you've got the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, which I think is a required course for anyone who loves watching media and movies, because it's your, it's your application of uh, what's it, um, required here, how we open up to the Holy Spirit, how we embody the Holy Spirit, how we let the Holy Spirit move through us. And there's some movies that are just so fantastic. There's always something to watch where you can see the, the higher consciousness level of it, the higher aspects of it, the more humane and the more human or the, the more loving way in all of these situations. How did you, how were you guided to look at movies? Because sometimes movies could seem kind of, um, jarring for us, but yet you dig deep into it. Yeah, well I think it, it started as part of my own process. Uh, first came the music. I think I just started to realize that I, I had a lot of denial going on. I, I was sitting on a lot of unconscious things that had not nearly been brought up into awareness. And so I was really praying with Jesus and saying there has to be a way to bring this uh, unconscious stuff to the surface. Isn't there a more rapid way to do it? And so first he was taking me to music stores and bringing in all types of music, uh, and I would just listen and have tears rolling down my cheeks and, and cracking open uh, with a wide variety of music. And uh, I've often felt I could even do a, a music lover's guide to enlightenment uh, at some point if I go back far enough in my process. And then the movies, came in where uh, he would be giving me commentary on movies. He would, he would say, let's go to the matinee. 
Uh, he would, back in the days of blockbuster video, rent, renting uh, videos and then uh, DVDs and, and really having me pause as I would be emoting in the middle of, uh, of a video or having huge emotions come up, uh, he would say, let's pause. Or if I was in a movie theater, um, I would just let the emotions come freely and my face was covered with all kinds of tears and emotions and then after it was over I would go out in my car and sit there with Jesus for maybe an hour and a half or two hours and he'd give me a whole download on, you know, I was saying, oh, that's, that's a, that. why did you take me to that scary movie? And he'd say, no, you're your mind is actually scary. <laughs> the movie, you're giving the meaning to the movie. <laughs> it's not a scary movie, it's a scary mind and, and seeing that in the movie. So he was teaching me about projection and he was flipping it all around to instructing me on how to clear my mind. So when it was very helpful, I started uh, using it. I started watching even more movies, doing commentary on movies and uh, someone one time predicted that would be my life, uh, that I would be like Dalai Lama I think had a, a movie theater built over there in uh, years ago in Tibet and uh, he would have them watch certain movies and they saw me as kind of having a watching movies with people and then doing commentary and going off to a little healing booth and processing all the emotions that came up during the movie, uh, when they were fresh, when they were fresh up in awareness and could be worked with. So that's how it started and it's still going on. I just did a movie with the community down here in Mexico uh, a few days ago called Perfect Sense uh, and uh, with, with commentary and yeah, we're, we're still uh, using it quite a lot. Good. All right. Let's talk about some of those movies because I know many would uh, love to check into that. And like I say, I use it um, before I go to sleep at night and it really puts me into this cocoon where the healing takes place after the movie. We could literally go to sleep. You come on and your team comes on afterwards sometimes and recaps it or um, presents the theme and the lessons there, and I love it. So some of the movies, one of the ones that I watched recently, a beautiful movie, um, The Beauty Inside. So, mm. I mean, I'm finding movies maybe that I watched even in the past that we come back around and hear your commentary, and it's a whole different movie. So uh, even the movie Lucy, let's talk about Lucy because that's where – um, she actually expands her consciousness and uses it in a huge way. So I have not seen your movie with the commentary on that, but what is the lesson of that movie, Lucy? Yeah, well, it, it starts off where she's a, a character playing, she was like a, a girlfriend, she has a boyfriend that she's not too sure about, and uh, suddenly he asked her to do something uh, for him that she doesn't want to do uh, and finds herself in the middle of uh, an interaction with these uh, Korean uh, gentlemen that is quite frightening and so she has huge fear at the beginning, uh, tears, uh, she's quite afraid of uh, harm coming to her and then through the metaphor of this uh, uh, substance that she's uh, been carrying, or actually is in a briefcase uh, that's been chained to her arm, uh, and and it gets eventually in, injected, or she's to carry it along with a group of others. It's a symbol. Uh, this blue powder is just a symbol of an of an expansiveness in the mind, where she starts to become in touch with all of the the uh, abilities, the psychic abilities, and the the abilities that they talk about a lot in parapsychology that sometimes are found in the yogis and the mystics and people who have ESP and so forth. Uh, she uh, begins to, as they say, use a higher percentage of her brain. We would say use more and more of her mind, become more aware of the power of the mind. And she has many expansions and uh, 
you see the fear leaving her. She's just uh, moving through this movie uh, in more and more of a fearless way as her mind, it, her perception expands, as she really accepts the power of her mind. And then I, I kind of call that movie like 20, 24 hours to enlightenment because it's, it's, it's so rapid, <laughs> the, the events that she goes through and, and the expansiveness that she goes through towards what we would call enlightenment or self-realization. So it's great to, to watch a movie like that where there's such a character transformation from a, from a frightened woman into an expansive being that is ready to surrender and uh, let the cells in her kind of be split open uh, to the point that she can enter the quantum field uh, and and reach that full expansiveness that transcends the body and the world entirely. So yeah, that, you're talking about a quite a powerful movie for anyone who uh, would want to be taken on a ride. And I think the comment commentary just helps uh, fill in, you know, keeps the perspective there, uh, so that you don't get distracted with uh, guns or bullets or uh, other things that can seem to be the ego gets uh, caught up in. Yes, that's a beautiful, beautiful movie. And so I just want to mention as well, uh, The Beauty Inside. That is a beautiful movie. Actually, when I watched it, it's Korean subtitled or subtitled in English of a Korean movie. And it was exquisite. And the whole night through, there was a healing that was done in that. And so share with us a little bit of the gist of that movie because it is really understanding the essence of who we are outside of this physical form. And that movie, just to bring people up to speed, is every day the being, and there's also an American version of it as well, and a couple of books written, but every day a person wakes up in a different physical body as a different person. That's hard to wrap the head around, but there's a beautiful story in that, a beautiful lesson. Yes. Yeah, just the adaptation that it takes to wake up uh, with a different form every day and uh, have a set of, uh, of clothes and shoes that you can, can, uh, can wear to make it through the day, that was quite an adaptation. But, but really the essence of it is the relationship uh, because we're used to thinking of relationship as between persons uh, that basically the persons may grow older and change a little bit, but not <laughs> changing to other persons. So, uh, uh, you know, people, we don't even have a concept for having uh, like a, a very devoted, committed, uh, monogamous relationship with a form that changes so much that uh, it breaks down all definitions of of human relationships pretty quickly and takes you into an experience of more of a of an unconditional uh, agape love that 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 Jesus talked about and that um, all spiritual traditions talk about a very expansive uh, definition of relationship. I remember I, I showed two movies one time I was working with a group over in uh, in Holland and I was doing a five-day retreat. I was halfway through and I, I prayed, you know, what do you want me to show them? And the Spirit said, show uh, the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix and the voice of Scarlett Johansson and show the beauty inside. Well, those two movies together just cracked the whole group open. I've never seen a group go from kind of very closed and cautious, afraid, because they were all just closed down. And then we watched these two movies together with commentary and then all the emotions came up and then by day five they were like running through the woods like little children uh, that are on recess when they're five years old. I, the, the change in consciousness was absolutely dramatic. And, and that's again just trusting the spirit to give us the mechanisms, in, including these these amazing movies, quantum movies, I would say, uh, to, to expand our, our perception in, in, a, in a very 
a fast way. Uh, yes, a very fast way indeed. And so beautiful that they returned into a childlike self. Awesome. So let's talk quantum because we are in this quantum world. We could even go deep in a conversation and see how reality really shifts in this quantum sense. And it really is this presence of now. So with these movies that you've watched and commentated on, what is your definition of quantum? Well, I would say the quantum is the experience that there, there is no world apart from consciousness. You know, we tend to think of, of the mind or even a sense of a private sense of a, of a brain with tied to individuals and that there's an external world where I think the teachings of quantum are really teaching us that, that there really is no inner and outer. That, that we're perceiving our consciousness. And so we have a great mirroring that's going on. So that anything we're perceiving in anywhere in the entire time-space cosmos is, is really our mind. It's like a motion picture of our mind. And it washes away this kind of inner outer thing. Like uh, before quantum uh, physics and before quantum science, we had Newtonian science, which was basically that the world was out there and the scientists would experiment on an external world to get data using the scientific method and pull forth from all this data to label and diagnose and describe uh, all the interactions that was happening in this external world. And then uh, quantum physics comes along and, and shows that, no, no, where's the consciousness in that old model? Uh, that actually it's all consciousness. And uh, so you have a, a quantum physicist, um, you know, even a couple decades ago named Paul Davies saying, uh, there is no world. And then Jesus saying the same thing in his Course in Miracles as the quantum physicist is saying, and, and he's saying it in Lesson 132, there is no world. He also says there is no world apart from what you think. So he's he's just showing that that it's a world of thoughts and, and we can clear our judgments to see the quantum field, to see the connectedness of everything. And that's very exciting. I just want to repeat what you said there, clear our judgments so we can see the quantum field. It really is a judgment that limits us, that keeps us from that. Yes, it's, it's truly the ego belief that is a belief in separation that tells us that the world is fragmented, the world is split, uh, and it's, it's a world of duality, the ego says, a world of multiplicity, a world of complexity. But it never talks about unity. It never talks about the unified field. It never talks about energy, how everything is is, is connected as, as energy. Uh, it's, it's always promoting a, a very fragmented uh, view of the world. And, and I would say even uh, Newtonian physics, you know, that falls into that. It was very much uh, trying to understand the world as if it's external and as if you can draw enough of empirical knowledge from these experiments to understand the world. And uh, I think now with quantum physics, we're understanding that, that the world can't be understood at all through that old modality, because it, it had a lot of false assumptions uh, that were underneath it. Yes, consciousness is it. So that's beautiful. So when we talk about unity and unity consciousness, Anyone watching this show, listening to it, is on the path to really living, we could call it a fifth dimensional way, where we are free of judgment, liberated from judgment, surrendering of the ego. And we all know it's an inside job. This is an inside job. So when you look at the greater whole and the collective and our, our planet, and, and some of the chaos that's going out there in the world. How do you advise one to really be present with themselves and 
move into unity consciousness? Well, I would say just with the, the understanding that everything that you perceive is, is coming from consciousness, uh, that you have a tremendous ability and really a power to heal and to have like a, a clearing take place, uh, uh, first an exposing of the unconscious and then a release and a clearing, that, um, that that's going to bring about the greatest impact uh, on the world because the world is a reflection of consciousness. So I think I'm always encouraging people with their spiritual practices. I'm always encouraging people to speak up uh, when they have things that, that are disturbing them. Uh, don't stuff it down. Uh, allow it up. Speak it up if, you, if that is helpful. Um, it's, I'm working always with people on uh, like our guidelines for our Course in Miracles Monastery instead of poverty, chastity, and obedience, obedience like the t traditional monasteries, ours are no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Those are our two guidelines. To let it come into conversation, let it, let it arise in awareness so that you can let it go. And, and then that will, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, if you're watching the news or you're triggered by a world event or by a personality, or by something that you feel is, is occurring that is wrong, you can start to uh, have a new perception of it by, by allowing that up and out. All right, I'm gonna give an example here. Well, there's a lot of examples in our world, okay? And I think the key point of what you're saying is don't hold it inside, let it come up and out, release it. So, for example, in, in our neighborhood, we have fracking, and it's moving into our backyard, literally our backyard, and now under our houses. And so, with something like that, we look inside ourselves and say, where do I feel fractured? Or, what would you advise for something like that? Right? When we feel so heavy in our hearts, but we yet feel the need to uh, step up and take some conscious action. What would you advise on something like that? Well, it's like, it's important to really let the emotions come up and then start to take a close look. If it's coming closer and closer, what are the, the sights that are disturbing to me? What are the sounds that are disturbing to me? Um, start right at the, the basic level because um, because the upsets are, are coming not from the events themselves, but from our interpretations of the events. If, if the upsets were coming from the events, we would be at the mercy. We would be a victim of the world, uh, powerless to effect change on all the factors and all the forces that are, seem to be going on all the time. But if we realize it's our power of interpretation uh, that's where the healing will occur. So, I would be very specific working with, with those upsets uh, on particular sights and sounds. Uh, we had a very similar thing um, at our monastery. It's in a very rural canyon in uh, Utah. And all of a sudden, uh, big heavy machinery came in and they decided to just, uh, right down from our monastery, start a, a rock quarry. Uh, just. Uh, digging into the rocks and and there were sights and sounds and machines uh, that weren't there before. And then another time there were oil trucks coming in and drilling for oil and natural gas in this very quiet, serene, secluded uh, uh, canyon, beautiful canyon. And then we had, to, everybody was working on their perceptions about the noise about what they were seeing with their eyes and then bringing it in to deal with the, the interpretation uh, and then ask for the higher power, ask for the spirit's reinterpretation, which is where the, the healing occurs. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. Thanks for sharing on that. It is the perception, so I get that. I understand it now clearly, and I think you've helped others to understand that. 
uh, because the perception of being a victim or it's wrong or, uh, yeah. And so as I did go through and process a little of that, uh, after an election, a recent election where we expected something to protect in this situation a little bit better, it didn't get that way. And so I was going, my ego was taking over and I was going into despair a little bit. And my higher self said loud and clear, uh, maybe it was the voice of Jesus. Who knows? It was this inner wisdom, this inner knowing that said, just watch. And it was very confident and calm. And it just said, just watch. And so since those weeks, we've had things that happen and you can see a mobilization of people who care. So uh, thank you for that. But really it is our dealing with our perception of it, dealing with the perception. So it's not easy to wrap our mind around, but if we can be calm, as you mentioned, in our heart and let those feelings come up and release, then we're clear and we can be inspired to take that action that we may need to to take, but to do it in a loving, compassionate way, right? I mean, we're not here to stand up and shout and resist anything, but maybe that gives us the inspiration to go and share the beauty of the land and the beauty to help other people re realize the beauty of this environment that we're in, right? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up perception because, um, you know, I. I remember when I came across a lot of people who work through the 12 steps, who are working through major addictions, uh, they have to first admit that they have a problem. Uh, if they remain in denial, then uh, the drinking just continues on for sometimes generations. But they come to an admission that um, the world as they know it, their, their life as they know it is unmanageable and they need a higher power to to have a, a change. And I think with Course in Miracles students, I've been advocating for years that if they all gathered around together and they say, hi, my name is so-and-so, uh, and I have a perceptual problem. Uh, and the next person says, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I have a perceptual problem. What it starts to do is it starts to reinforce, allow in the idea that instead of all these specific problems that I'm reacting to, as if they're coming at me from the world, I can start to realize that I have a distorted perception problem and it's coming from my beliefs and my thoughts. And it's not coming from the projected world, it's the world is an effect of my beliefs and thoughts. And so it's a big, you're right, it's a big turnaround. Most of us, we went to class, we went to science class, we learned that sound waves come into the ear and they come and they hit the eardrum and then the little neurons are triggered and then the brain, you know, we were taught that the world is outside of us. The light comes in through our retinas and then the image is reversed and, and interpreted by the brain. We were taught a backward system that actually isn't true, that are kind of like that movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, where Ramtha is talking like a, the eyes are more like the projectors and the ears are more like speakers. And our consciousness is generating the world that we perceive. So we are not at the mercy of an external world. We are literally beginning to realize that we are generating and projecting the world that we see. And we can change that picture by forgiving, by clearing away attack thoughts, grievances, judgments, and literally the world that we perceive will, will change and reflect a new way of, uh, of thinking and believing. That feels so good. And so I would assume that you are a great optimist as you are working to assist people in this um, journey of forgiveness and uh, self-cultivated peace and love and interconnection. So uh, it's a good thing, right? This awakening, there is an awakening happening. Would you agree? Yes, it, it has been my experience, a direct experience of, of this awakening. And uh, I remember growing up, the people, I would hear from uh, my parents, you know, if you, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. And uh, this awakening is more, you actually 
come in contact with the love, with the happiness, the joy. And that's what you're sharing uh, with every encounter, with every person you meet. You just feel it coming through you and extending. Even when I went to uh, Beijing, China one time, I, I got picked up at the airport and they took me and, and the people in the car, they were apologizing for me, to me for the gray skies and the pollution over Beijing. And I, I said, I love gray. <laughs> and they were like, look, and we had the most joyful connection and ride in the car because uh, to me, when you've had that love in your heart and you want to connect with and radiate with everyone that you meet, you, you won't be looking for problems. You'll be extending the, the love and the, extending the solution. See, I love that. It is so beautiful. So that is our focus. Stay centered on extending the love, which is the solution. Oh my goodness, it makes me want to cry on that. All right, that's how I know it's true for me. So that's so beautiful. Okay. All right, well, I just want to say that the, the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, actually was a great catalyst in my life as well. So uh, awesome that you mentioned that. And that is in your Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. All right, so as we wrap up, you mentioned Perfect Sense, your most recent movie that you are in Mexico with, with a group, and you had some commentary on that. Can you share with us the lesson in that movie and the gist of it? Well, I think the gist of it is that, that the five senses are actually in cahoots. It's, it's part of uh, the egoic system. And so we've heard for years the spiritual traditions emphasize meditation, prayer, going within. Uh, it's an inside job. And I use that movie to, to have everyone watch their emotions as, uh, as the main characters and uh, the human race basically uh, would go through phases of, of very intense emotions coming up in this movie. Extreme emotions, extreme grief extreme loss, extreme uh, uh, sadness, and, and, and then sometimes there'd be uh, hunger with it or uh, rage with it. But it was a, a very symbolic movie of let's let all this unconscious uh, darkness come up and pass through. And let's find a way where we can really see that, like that quantum connection that connection that we all have in mind, in consciousness, that's real. If we let go of, of everything else that we believe that stands in the way. So it was quite a, quite a ride. Every time I, I show that movie, it's, it's one of the more extreme. I think, you know, you, it's more the deep end uh, as far as movie watching goes. But uh, when you're ready, that's another one that's it's good to pause it and and just to let the emotions fully uh, come up and pass through. Truly healing with the movies. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. This has been an exquisite quantum conversation. I know we're all elated, and we thank you so much for that. And again, the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment is highly recommended, and I just thank you for... My goodness, look at you. Oh, as we wrap up, I do have one last question because to, to take that leap of faith that you did to listen to this inner guidance and to pack up and travel, you actually have changed your perception and your energetics with money. And can you share a little bit about that? Because you... Um, it's almost like a, I, there's no lack consciousness, there's a trust, but it's a new way where you allow yourself to just go do and take care of what you're feeling the call is, and money comes to you, the universe supports you. Yeah, yeah, that's like this divine providence that I think um, St. Francis talked about and uh, Mother Teresa talked about and Jesus even talked about uh, 
you know, take no thought for what you shall wear or eat. You know, it, it just, we will be so provided for. So that was part of the faith and trust. And then I find that, that resources, money, anything that would be helpful in spreading this very happy message, this message of freedom, uh, this message of, of, of forgiveness and release, it comes and flows very, very easily. And there's not a, a focus at all on uh, where's, it, where's the money going to come from. Uh, that's not the first question. In fact, that, that isn't a question at all. It's, it's just like a big orchestration, almost like a big symphony orchestra. So that, that is true, that it, it took lessons at the beginning when I was traveling to trust that if I needed a place to stay or I needed money uh, to, for gasoline for the car or whatever, it would be provided. And then after years of that happening, uh, I, I really started to relax into, okay, Spirit, you've got this, and I can just focus on extending the love and trust that everything else is perfectly handled. Yes, and there was a movie, and you made a comment about, I, I don't recall what movie it was, but you, you, you were going out on your journey, and you ended up in Oklahoma, and you went to A Course in Miracles workshop at the end, and that group welcomed you, and it was a beautiful experience. You even went to the Cowboy Museum. And so my question to you is, how were you guided to go to Oklahoma? I mean, did a book fall off the shelf? Did it something open up in a newspaper? Because some would say, why Oklahoma? <laughs> but it started, I was in Cincinnati and I started to feel, I used the word impelled. I kept being impelled to tr take a trip and I just finally gave into it. And uh, I said, all right, I will do this. And uh, I don't know how I'm going to, be provided for. I don't know how it's going to work, but I will hop in the car and I will go uh, out that way driving from Cincinnati and down Highway 40. And, and, and then that actually Oklahoma was my second, uh, my second day uh, and second night. And so it was early on. That was like day two for me in my whole divine providence journey that has gone on now for decades. That was day two, and uh, it was uh, just trusting, because I had a, a Miracle Distribution Center list uh, that had uh, course groups, but still, I would not typically go for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes of a group, <laughs> and yet Jesus said, get in there. And, uh, and, then, <laughs> and then the group ended, and they took, they took me out to lunch, and oh, stay at my apartment and let's go out on my houseboat and I was just blown away. I was absolutely blown away and that was just the second day out. So it took a lot of um, experiences, miraculous experiences to convince me that that I could trust so much that I could really let Jesus be in charge and let Jesus go before me. Before that it was more just like a concept but then there I found myself in Oklahoma saying, okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's, you, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to prove to me that this will actually work. And I have to say, it's just gone on and on for decades now. Congratulations. I know there are many who would love to do that and just step in that and go with it full force. And you're a beautiful role model on how to do that. So I thank you for that. And my goodness, you have been around the world, uh, many countries. Your books are translated. You've got a new book coming out. You've got Living Miracles Centers um, on our planet and more probably are going to come out of that. And we just thank you for this work. It's tremendous. Thank you, awesome. Lauren. Oh, thank you. It's such an honor to be on your show. And, and I love how it just happened so easily. Uh, you wrote to me, would you like to collaborate? That's, that's one of my favorite words in the English language. <laughs> so it, it just keeps going on and on where we keep sharing these blessings. So thank you for having me. Thank you, David Hoffmeister. Uh, a supreme A Course in Miracles teacher. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>